Good morning. morning. My name is Aaron and I'm the location pastor here and I'm going to do something a little different today. Like I I got a stool um, because I'm not not going to preach to you. I'm not going to preach at you today. And that's a little different for me. We're going to walk through some texts today where Jesus sets up and shows us this discipline. And it's probably the discipline I am not the greatest at. The one that was probably exposed to latest in my life in, a, in, a, in what the disciplines are. And I'm not good at it because it's not how I'm wired and it's not how our world operates and functions. Um, before I get into that, just so you know, like one of the things that we've been using as a resource in this is this book right here by Richard Foster called Celebration of Discipline. And it walks through these nine spiritual disciplines. And you can go back and forth on if there's only nine or if there's more. It's just, it's indifferent. It's not a topic that is worth debating about. But he walks through nine of them. And so if you want that book, we offer it here in our resources at the back where you can go find it on Amazon or whatever bookstore you order from. But I just wanted you to know that 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 was something that we were using in this. And one of the things that he says in this book um, that really got me and got me to thinking was this, and it says, the person who views the disciplines as laws will always turn silence into absurdity. See, the disciplines, they're they're not laws, they're tools. They're things that we can use, that we can apply. And how many of you have the person that you know, or maybe it's your husband that just buys all the tools and doesn't really ever use them, or you don't think they use them, and they stay pretty and they look pretty? That's what a lot of times we do with the disciplines. We've been going through the last several weeks of prayer and fasting, scripture study and memorization. We're going to go into one in the next couple of weeks on corporate worship. And we were going through these disciplines, but are we just adding them to the toolbox or are they tools that we're applying to our life? And this is one that I think is crucial with the world that we live in. Because everything else in our world is so loud. Am I right, church? Like, and you're like, well, one of the reasons the world is loud is because people like you, Aaron, are loud. And that's what my wife would say in this moment because I married one of the people, like, I want to go and do stuff. I want to hang out with people. I want to be in environments. I want to have experiences. I want to go do something. And my wife would be totally cool if I took the kids and we left for four days and nobody else touched the house and she could just sit in complete silence and not turn on the TV, not turn anything on, throw her phone in the sink and drown it in water so it doesn't work anymore and get to a point, how many of you are like, just thrive for those moments where I don't want anybody else around? And matter of fact, there are days in my life where I'll go three or four days without talking to anybody and I get to that fourth day and I'll just go, oh, just to make sure my voice works. <laughs> like that, that, for me, I'm like, what do you, like I have to talk to somebody. Like that is one of the things I thrive to be around people and that's just how I'm wired. And so as we walk through this discipline today and called silence and solitude, it does not line up with the world that we live in. Again, this is not how I'm wired. And so I have to be intentional in this discipline. But a lot of times we use it as an excuse that our world is just so loud. And everything is so busy and so crazy and chaotic that we use it as a scapegoat, as an out, because If God says that he speaks in a still, small voice, where do we get to the spot that we can hear something quiet? We don't, most of the time. See, we, again, we live where it's loud and it's crazy, and like even moments of, guys, go to an experience or go to a game or something, and you have a moment of silence for something that takes place, that can kind of like get a little awkward sometimes even. I mean, I'm sure some of us are having a moment of silence right now for the Razorback football season, but that's nothing new. Um, So, sidebar, That that was just interjected. We live in a loud, a world that is so loud that we don't even know how to calm everything down. And again, I am someone that's loud, it's excited and ready. Like I love, I'm the person that walks into the house and the TV's going on, we're turning on music, we're setting an environment. I want it to be engaging, I want it to be exciting. And Kaylee's like, what are you doing? Please, just like, I've been, I, I just need a, a moment. 
I don't want to talk to anybody else. I'm like, I haven't seen you all day. I want to talk to you the rest of the night. Let's talk. What do you want to talk about? I don't care what we talk about. Let's just talk. Aaron, stop. It's, a diff- it's the difference in our house. We get to these moments, and me especially, I don't know about you, had to be intentional on some of these disciplines. There's an article I read about this in the world that we live in. We have to learn that we're humans, not machines. We're human, we're not machines. We have to have moments where we stop and we be still and we recalibrate. So we're gonna walk through a text in Luke chapter four, three and four today, and we're gonna add one in Mark. And I'm gonna walk through these, these moments that Jesus was intentional about showing us this discipline of silence and solitude. And again, I'm, I wanna walk us through this and teach this, and that's why I got the stool up here so I can be more intentional on walking us through this text. Otherwise, I'm gonna be back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And the last time I preached sitting down, I couldn't move, and that was the only reason I was sitting down. But today, I'm gonna be intentional on it. And so, we're gonna look at what Jesus did as we walk through these examples. And the first one that we're gonna look at is in Luke chapter three, in verse 16. And again, I I love that we get to be in a season as a church where you hear the the pages in the Bible begin to turn. And so as I let you get there, this is one of the first moments that we get to see what takes place as Jesus steps into his ministry. Um, In these times, at 30 years old is when a priest was coming out of their training, and at 30 was when they were of age to go out and be able to lead their ministry on their own. They were stepping into their priesthood. So John the Baptist, who is his cousin, is a few, year, a few months older than him. And he, he has started his priesthood, so now he is able to baptize people. And he has this moment where he is baptizing people in the river, and then he's telling people about Jesus that is returning. And so in, in verse 16 of Luke chapter 3, it says, John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming. The strap of the, whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. And he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And his winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So he's setting the stage here. Hey, somebody else is coming. Like I am a human I am a vessel, I am a tool, and I baptize you in the, in the name of what is coming, but there is someone who is coming after me that is even greater and has more authority and more power, and I am not worthy of who he is. See, we are, we are not worthy of Jesus and what he's done for us, but he is sacrificed all, and so we begin to see this transpire as it's the moment that John has stepped into his ministry and Jesus is now stepping in because this is where he gets baptized. And so we make the shift and we go to verse 21. Now, when all the people were baptized, so everyone's done, it's a party, they're celebrating. Again, remember we sell it, when we have baptisms here, you know we get rowdy, we get excited because what was lost was now found, what was dead is now alive, what was old is now new. And they are a brand new creation in Christ. And we're seeing this take place with these people as he's baptizing them. And when all the people were baptized and Jesus had then been baptized and he was praying, the heavens were opened. And the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven and said, you are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. In this moment, Jesus is now stepping into his ministry. And as he steps into this, something takes place in his life. And his life is now repurposed. This is what takes place in our lives when we say yes to following Jesus and make him the Lord of Lord, the King of Kings, the boss and rescuer, savior of our lives. We're saying, hey, I, my life now is not only being repurposed, but it has a totally new purpose. So until this point, he was the son of Mary and Joseph. He was the coming Messiah. He was all these things that you can read about. But this is the moment that he now steps out in front of the public and he says, I am going to do this. 
I'm going to step into my calling. I'm going to step into what the purpose is that God the Father has given me. So his life has now been repurposed. He has now has a new purpose in his life. But what happens whenever you have a new purpose is you have to learn to navigate that new purpose. And so in this moment, we see the first thing that Jesus does after this mountaintop experience. I'm sure there's a few of us in this room that have, if not all of us, have had a mountaintop experience and we've met with God and he's done something magnificent in our life. He's redeemed us, he's restored us. And then we've tried to just ride that high out. That experience, we're living life off of that experience, what God did in that moment, rather than being intentional and following the moment up of continuing to meet with God for what is next. See, God isn't just the God of a moment. He is the God of yesterday, tomorrow, and forever. And so we get to see what Jesus does after everyone celebrated, everyone's got excited. Like we, the Holy Spirit has now shown up and spoke over Jesus, his son, saying, this is my son whom I am well pleased. So in this, he goes from a repurpose and he knows that he has to do this. He has to refocus. I know my purpose is something different, but now I have to step into a new focus. When scripture says that the old is gone and the new is here, you are made a brand new creation. You are now alive in Christ. Paul sets it up as being the transformed in the renewing of your mind. We have to learn to live and act and do differently today than we did yesterday. It's the process of discipleship. It's the sanctification to be made holy. And so Jesus is walking this out and he knows in this moment that the enemy's plan isn't just to trip you up, isn't just to redirect you, but he wants to take you out. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. You can have people that speak into your life and say, hey, if you're just complacent, then the enemy's not gonna target you. Don't let him tell that he is. If you are a follower of Jesus, if you profess that Jesus is the Lord of your life, he is coming after you. His goal for everybody is to take them out. That's his job. He doesn't want anybody to live up to the expectation. He is after you. And so if he's after, he is after Jesus as well. And so in this, he has to refocus. And so he goes straight into solitude in Luke chapter four. And so it says, and Jesus, full of what? The Holy Spirit. Returned from the Jordan, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days. And when they ended, he, he was hungry. He's fully God, he's fully human. So he went straight from his moment of baptism into this moment of silence and solitude, seeking God the Father, saying, I need to spend intentional moments with him because my purpose is now new, so I need to refocus my next steps to align with the steps that he wants me to take. And so he does this, and I think we miss something here, is that Jesus knew he was going to be tested. He knew the temptations were going to come. And yet there's a lot of times that we give ourselves a lot of credit and a lot of grace thinking that we can get through the trials and the temptations on our own. If Jesus himself had to go and prepare for a test, trial, and temptation, if he had to prepare for it being fully human, why do we think we can do it on our own? Why do we think we're equipped? Because I can tell you across this room right now, I can look at all of you and I can look in the mirror and I can tell you, you are not Jesus. We can strive for that, but we are going to fall short. And so Jesus in this moment, we catch that he is going to be tempted with every temptation possible. So the same thing that you experience every single day, that bondage, that addiction, that insecurity, that doubt, all those things that you carry, he was tempted the same way also. It says that when he was upon the cross, boring all sin, all shame, all guilt. So the sin that you struggle with, Jesus walked through also. Now he did it perfectly, faultlessly, blamelessly, but then also that means that the one that you don't struggle with, 
the one that you don't even engage with, the one that you don't consider, that somebody else, their life is just tripping over and tripping over and tripping over. He wrestled with that one too, but he knew the enemy was going to tempt him. So he knew the enemy was going to try and take him out. So he said, I have to go and I have to refocus because I have a new purpose. And my purpose now is greater. I'm stepping into my calling now. And so I have to be prepared for what is coming. And if you read the story, the enemy didn't waste any time at all. As soon as he walked out of this moment of 40 days meeting with God the Father, Satan was waiting on him. How many of you have been through that moment where you've had this crazy, incredible experience with God and blessing and favor and direction, and then as soon as you walk out of the doors on a Sunday morning, as soon as you go and tell the next person, someone else has already texted you and tried to slide in and redirect where you're going is what the enemy's trying to do. He did the same thing with Jesus. But Jesus knew how to respond. He knew how to answer because he met with God in a moment of silence and solitude and discipline for 40 days, knowing that it was coming. So if Jesus was intentional about these moments, why are we not? See, again, it's, it's a discipline. It's something that we have to learn how to do. I'm not great at this one. In fact, the first time that I experienced silence and solitude was when I was a sophomore in college, and it was a requirement experience for one of my classes. I played golf in college at the university I went to, and golf was kind of always my escape. It was the place that I would go because at at that season of my life, no one really else played golf except for the people on the golf team with me. And we had a putting green on campus and some other places, and it was off to the edge of the campus. And I could go there, and I could get away from everyone else. So we had this task, this assignment, as we walked through the spiritual disciplines. And our professor said, hey, silence and solitude is the one for this week. And every week as we walked through these disciplines, we had to write a paper on them. And I'm a good writer, so I can write my way to a grade. And I promise you, I did it plenty. I could do it today. I love writing. I'm good at it. And so I had this, we had this experience, and I was like, okay, I'm going to the golf course, I'm going to the putting green, it's going to be quiet, it's going to be still, I can focus on my breathing, I can get calm, I can get settled, and I'll just listen. I'll be available to what God wants to do and wants to share with me in that moment. So I went out, and it was about out there for about an hour as it began to get dark, and then after it got dark, I went in to go eat and all that, and I wrote my paper out, and I, I told the professor what I experienced or what took place, and or what I thought took place. And then I got the paper back the following week and it had an F on it. And I was like, homie, I know this is a good paper. I know I went out and I did the assignment. Like, why are you giving me F? And there was a note and it said, you did not experience silence and solitude. And he highlighted the underlined places because when I went to my space and I went to my place, it was a putting green, it was quiet, but I was still focused on other things that were minor but my focus wasn't directly on God, the Father, the Spirit in that moment. And so this was the first realization of, okay, like for this silence and solitude, you have to be still and you have to be calm and you have to remove everything else out to the best of your ability possible. Because I don't want to get another F. No, it wasn't just for a grade. It was to learn what these disciplines were about. And if God speaks in a still, small voice, where are we going for atmospheres where we can truly listen and discern the direction of God or what he wants to speak into us? And so Jesus has done that. He's going in, and so once he leaves from this moment, and he's experienced this with going through temptation and trials, we see him step into the next part. And the next part is where it starts to get pretty cool. And it says, and Jesus returned in the power of the what? The spirit to Galilee. And a report about him went through all the surrounding country. Remember, he's been removed for 40 days and people are already talking about the fact that he was baptized and that he is here and what John the Baptist has said about him. And he comes out and he went in with this moment to refocus. 
And when you go into refocus, he knows he's going to need to be refreshed and all these kinds of things. But when he comes out, there's something different that he has prepared for. And so he goes and he comes out with the spirit. So this is what he has received. This is he's now refocused. And what happens next? Well, here's what happens. We get to Luke 5. And now even more, the report about him has gone abroad and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. So he's had this moment where he's got baptized and he's gone into the wilderness and he's met with God. He walks out, he goes through a temptation and then from the temptation he goes and the people are waiting on him. And he goes out and he begins to perform miracles and healings and things And people do what people are really, really good at to Jesus in this moment. They exhaust him. Do people ever exhaust you? Ever just drain you? Like they take everything out of you? Like again, I'm a people person, but you can get to moments where it's like, I don't know if I want to be around any other people anymore. And there's a weight to ministry and these things that take place when... People are latching to Jesus because they know who he is and what he has to offer. And so he is pouring everything out to them because you know as much as I do that if you're pouring something good out, people are going to take up as much of it as they possibly can. We're a greedy culture. If there's something good there, we are going to find it. We're going to seek it and we're going to take as much as we possibly can. And they're doing the same thing with Jesus in this moment. We're seeing healings. We're seeing miracles. We're hearing him teach magnificent things. And he's saying, I'm getting tired. And in this, I'm getting tired. He has to go in again to withdraw to desolate places and to pray. And when he does this, he goes in with the heart to refresh. God, I know I need to have a new direction. I know I need to be encouraged by you. I know your spirit needs to lead me. I need, I need to rest in this moment. And so he goes in to be refreshed, spend intentional time with God the Father again. And there's a great thing that takes place when people want to be around you. But when you pour yourself up, you know, throughout the week, we come to church on Sunday morning, says we're pouring out our bucket, we're serving. I'm excited about what I get to share with you because of what God's done in my life throughout the week. So now I'm pouring myself out to you in the moments I've had with God and preparing for this lesson for this text. You, your life group leaders and facilitators have it in those moments. You're, when you're serving in kids ministry, you have these things. You pour out because you have met with Jesus throughout the week. In your workplace, you're, you're, in the, you're, you're, you're disciplined quiet times every single day. When people are drawn to you, they see something different. They attach to you. They're drawn to you because they know you have something to offer in the life change of the fact that the Holy Spirit is leading and guiding you wherever you go. You see, not only did Jesus take on every sin, every guilt, every transgression, every temptation, every shame, but the moment that he was crucified, it says, we're going to walk through the corporate worship here in a couple of weeks on the Old Testament process and the weight of what it was to worship in the temple and to the experience of the Holy of Holies and the Spirit of God. In those moments, People, humans, could not experience the Spirit of God. And in this moment where Jesus is crucified, the moment he breathed his last breath, it says that the veil to the Holy of Holies was torn from the top to the bottom, showing that we have now access to the Holy Spirit. So the moment that you say yes to following Jesus, God, I am broken, I am hurting, I am missing, I don't know where to go, I'm confused, I'm in a desolate place in my life right now, and I need you to revive me, to put something in me. The moment you cry out and say that he is the Lord of lords and King of kings and the Lord of your life, that same Holy Spirit that we didn't have access to in the Old Testament now resides within you. But he speaks in a still, small voice. You know, I've heard the Holy Spirit loud and clear in my life plenty, probably, but that was probably more for conviction than it was for direction. He's telling you, hey, you you need to cut that out. Like, I I don't want you to ruin your life. I don't want you to destroy where you're at. But when we're looking for direction, it's a different mindset and it's a different heart. It's not him realigning us. It's just coming saying, hey, 
I know you're there and I'm going to be still and I'm gonna be quiet and I'm gonna listen. And Jesus goes, everybody's been at him and they're expectant and they know he's gonna do something. So he goes into this moment to refresh. But not only, he goes in to refresh, but when he goes in to refresh, he receives. What does he receive? It says that he went in with the power. The power. This is something he consistently modeled. We're seeing a pattern here that he's meeting with God and he's received the power and that he knows the direction that he's going. But he would withdraw to desolate places and to pray. What is your atmosphere? What is your place? Because like I said, for me, I thought it was the golf course. Some of this is like, I just like to drive. I'm going to get in my car. I'm going to turn the music off. I'm going to roll the windows down. And I'm just going to drive. Well, your focus is still on other things that are around you. Or at least I hope your focus is still on the road. Some of us, not so much. You ever get into those moments where you're like, I'm just driving and you get to your spot and you're like, I don't know how I got here. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what happened between in the last 45 minutes. I just know I arrived alive. Thank you, Jesus. It's different. And it doesn't make sense here. Again, when we begin to look at the spiritual disciplines as laws, the discipline of silence is going to sound like an absurdity. It's not going to sound like it's possible. We go in with an expectation of what we know we need to be refreshed. It says in Psalms 23, you make me lie down in green pastures. You make me lie down in green pastures. Usually when we get to a point in life where God makes us do something, we've missed it already. Because we haven't prepared, we haven't been available, we haven't been aware. And so the psalmist is saying, that you make me lie down in green pastures, restore my soul. If God is making us lie down, then we've already missed the part where he's saying, hey, why don't you meet with me? Let me show myself to you. Let me, let me be there for you. If you would just be still and be quiet. We just think about it. Why would I fight my battles? Why would I fight my battles if you already have won? If I would just let you handle the situations in my life. If I would just be still and let God be God. Let him do his job. But no, I got this. I know the system. I know what's coming next. I know the play. I know, I know the loudness of the world. And then besides, also, if I get quiet, if I get into a spot that's still and there's nothing else around, the things that are going to talk loudest are the thoughts that I have about myself. Those are the things that are going to scream at me. And letting God even speak against those and step in. He goes in to refresh and he comes out and he's received. And in this season, we get to see something else take place. You see, when, when Jesus walks out in a moment, John the Baptist, he finds out, has been killed. His cousin, his best friend, he's been martyred. The king and their, his family, they wanted John the Baptist gone. And so we see this moment where Jesus is hurting. And in that moment as well, he removes himself. And he goes to spend time with God. He's hurting. God, I don't, I don't know what to do next. My friend is gone. My, my brother, my cousin, like the person I'm close to, he's gone. The person I was, I was following, the person that now one of the people I'm leading, he's gone. Where do I go? What do I do? He goes and spends time with God again to be restored, to be encouraged. And we get back and, and the disciples come out to him in Mark chapter 6. And in Mark chapter 6, verse 30 and 31, it says, The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. They're excited. They've been seeing things happening in the lives around them because, hey, they're close to Jesus. They, he's been teaching them. He's been raising them up. And now they're doing great things. But people are starting to attach to them as well. 
And so Jesus models and shows them something here. He says, the apostles returned to Jesus and told them all that they had done and what they had been taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure to even to eat. They weren't even paying attention. They were just in the grind of the daily life, doing what all, this is exciting, this is invigorating, God's doing great things here. I can't wait to tell Jesus about this thing. And they're going, they're not taking time, they're not even eating, they're not even resting. And Jesus is saying, hold up, let me show you something. Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest. How long? For a while. When was the last time that you turned everything off? Oh, I can't, I can't do that. You're already losing. You already are tied and addicted or insecure to some device or some expectation or a dependency to someone else that you're missing an encounter and experience something that God has for you. You see, the father always knows what we need. We walk through these moments and, and Jesus is showing them here, hey, you guys need to go in and you need to rest. But when you go into rest, what happens when you come out is you're going to be revived. You're going to have energy to keep doing the things you're celebrating. Don't let it just be a, a, the story that you once told in the mountaintop experience. Let it be something you get to consistently tell because God does something else because you're revived to keep going. See, moms know this well because they'll just go to the bathroom for 10 minutes and lock the door. We watch Bluey in our house all the time. And I don't know if it's because our kids like it or if it's just because I like it. But there's an episode with mom and Bluey uh, is trying to get her attention. And she's like, I just need 10 minutes. And she tries to go to her room and she tries to go to another place. And finally she goes to the bathroom. She locks the door and Bingo goes and knocks on the door. She's got, I got a potty. And she's like, I just need 10 minutes. And so Bingo guards the door as everybody else is trying to get to her. And she's like, mom just needs 10 minutes. Do you have someone in your life that can guard your space where you're meeting with God? where you're going, you have to learn to set an atmosphere where your expectation in is going. I know whatever it is that Jesus is showing us here, I need to go in because I have a new purpose. That's why I need to refocus. So he went in with a new purpose, but God came out and showed him, hey, this is how you're gonna refocus. He said, he, he went in with a moment that he knew he needed to be refreshed. And when he went to be refreshed, he received. And then he went and he showed the disciples, say, you need to rest. And now you're going to be revived. The other night we were getting everything wound down in our house. And Blake, our two-year-old little girl, she's easy to get to sleep. Blake, are you ready to go to bed? Yeah, night, night. She runs off, pulls the covers up. She's gone. Got her binky just gone. Now back home is another story. Beckham will grind you out because he's like his daddy and he doesn't want to miss anything. Well, you're watching the Thunder game or you're watching a football game or you're, you're, you're watching, like, I, I just want to be near you. And he said that the other night. We turned everything off and he said, I just want you to hold me. I just want to be close to you. I just want to be with you. But me as, as dad, as a father, I knew he didn't just need to be close to me. He didn't just need me to hold him. He needed to rest. I knew he needed to go to sleep. And so, so many times when we go into these atmospheres that we, we go and go, God, I know I, I want this. I need this. I, what I desire, what I'm, I'm coming to you with this. He's saying, yeah, I know that. But not only is there that, but I know you need this. And if you would be still and if you would be quiet and let me speak that into you and let me show you that. When we silence ourselves and we get to a spot of solitude, God is always gonna bring relief. And it may be a relief that you don't even know that you need. We live in a busy and loud world, I know. A lot of distractions but silence and solitude isn't a destination. It's not a check mark. It's a discipline. 
And silence is not the foreground. It's not the thing that we're searching for. Solitude is not the thing that we're searching for. See, silence and solitude, they're not the foreground, they're the background. They're always there. It's what everything builds off of. Silence and solitude is what we're searching for. We're going in for an encounter with the Spirit of God. So what we think in life so much is we need to seek out and search for the moments that are silent and the moments that are quiet and the moments that get away. No, that is the atmosphere where you get to hear and sense the voice and spirit of God. That's what you're searching for. That's what you're longing for. You're longing for an encounter with Jesus, the Holy Spirit. That's what you need. He will always bring what you need. And it's a discipline. It's not going to be easy. It's the grind. It's the work to get to the reward, to get to the experience, to get to where God can say, I am building you. I am taking you where I want you to go. Again, you can walk in with an expectation, but when you walk in with an expectation, be available and aware to what God is going to show you because he knows what you need to refocus, to refresh, to revive, be expectant. We're gonna move into a moment of worship today that's still and it's quiet and it's calm and communion here in just a moment. And Reed's gonna set that up. Both every about and every eye closed in this moment, I just wanna pray for us. This isn't something that comes natural to most of us even the ones that like to live in a quiet world. The intentionality to go beyond to expect and to receive from God. I'm gonna pray for us in this moment and then Reed will come back out and he'll he'll set us up and walk us through communion and what that is. But with every bow and every eye closed in this moment, if you would just say, hey, whether it's placing your hands in front of you open if you want to raise your hands in a moment, say, God, I'm available. I just want to pray for us today. All of us to be still. To be still and know that I am God. To hear a still, small voice. To be ready, available, expectant. If Jesus was disciplined in these things, then they are imperative to be placed within our lives. So Father, today we thank you. God, for who you are. God, what you have in store. God, the fact that you had an ultimate plan and still have a plan that fits in the palm of your hand. God, that we trust you with that as a prayer, as a heart today. God, I pray we'd be available. God, we set up atmospheres and take opportunities to rest, to be revived, God, to go in with new purpose, to refocus, God, to go in to be refreshed and to receive what you have for us, God, and in all things, relief, because you know what we need. God, I pray today that we seek you. God, that we know that you are all around us, God, you are always there, but we are the ones that have to be still and calm and silent to make ourselves known to you that we're ready to receive, that we're available to you. God, I pray for the world and for the distraction around us, God, that we can learn to be dismissive to those cultures and those things and our heart be focused on you. God, I pray for those in the room right now who are wrestling with the fact that there are just so many things that are clouding my life. I don't even know where to start or where to go that they would just begin the journey to start. God, that you would show them that you are there. God, I pray for there be something fresh and exciting and invigorating in the lives that begin to move today through who you are. God, I thank you for the fact we have salvation and process of sanctification as we seek you. God, we bring our struggles before you, but we don't only bring struggles, God, but we bring expectation to have an encounter with you. God, we're grateful for you. God, I thank you for this place. I thank you for our church. God, and for all that you have in store, we give you the glory, we give you the honor, we give you the praise. In Jesus' name.